I'm not ashamed. Did Jesus really walk on the water, or was it some sort of deception? This is the question that we seek to answer today as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Matthew on walking through the Bible. The glory of his cross. If you have a Bible with you, turn to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to be reading from verses 22 to 33. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry. Just follow along with us on the screen. The version that we'll be reading from is the New King James Version. So, Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were with him in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. In the last episode, we have Jesus feeding over 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. Jesus did not do this as a way to teach the people the gospel. He did so because they had already spent the day with him, and out of compassion, he decided to provide them a meal. After this, Matthew said that Jesus immediately sent the disciples away into a boat while he went on a high mountain to pray. This might seem peculiar, but in John 6, a parallel of this passage, we find that the multitude after this miracle tried to make him a king by force, so Jesus fled into the mountain in order to escape the people and told his disciples to go to the other side. Jesus was not going to be made a king against his will, and as readers of the Bible know, Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. It was not an earthly kingdom in his day. It is not an earthly kingdom today, and it will not be an earthly kingdom in the future. Jesus' kingdom exists for sure today, but it is a spiritual kingdom ruled over by a spiritual king, Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God in heaven. So night had fallen completely. Jesus is in a mountain praying, and the disciples are in the middle of the Sea of Galilee in the midst of a windstorm that was causing the waves to crash against the boat. Matthew then tells us that at the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. The Romans divided the night into four three-hour segments. And so what we're talking about here is the time between 3 and 6 a.m. This would be the darkest point of the night, and because of the storm, the disciples had very likely been up all night trying to ensure that they didn't sink. Why did Jesus wait so long to come to the aid of his disciples? We're not entirely sure. Perhaps he needed that much time to pray, or perhaps Jesus was testing the faith of the disciples. Since Matthew doesn't tell us, it is not important to know why Jesus waited. Just We just need to know that he did. In the darkness of the storm, all the disciples see in the sea is a dark figure approaching them. They think it is a ghost or a spirit. That ghosts are referenced in Scripture does not prove that ghosts roam this earth, but it does show us that the people of that time believed in them. Ecclesiastes 12.7 would teach us that the spirits return to God at death. They do not remain here on earth to haunt the living. Not understanding what they were seeing, it is only natural for the disciples to be afraid. Trying to calm their fears, Jesus calls out to them, saying, Be of good cheer, for it is I. Even that didn't cause the disciples to believe, for Peter replied that if it was Jesus, he would command him now to come to him on the water. Jesus told Peter to come. And to Peter's credit, he didn't argue. He stepped over the side of the boat and stepped into the water. This would have required faith, something that Peter did possess. However, his faith was not great, for when he got out into the boat and began to walk towards Jesus, he started to sink after he looked around at the storm that was raging around him. He cried out for the Lord to save him, which Jesus did. He asked Simon Peter why he doubted, to which Peter had no response. However, it is obvious from Jesus' response that the problem was that Peter at that point in time may have had faith in Jesus, but it was little faith, not strong faith. When Jesus got into the boat, the storm stopped. The disciples were yet amazed, even though they had seen something similar in chapter 8, and worshipped Jesus as the Son of God, for only the Son of God could do these things. 
Now, before we close, there are some who charge that Jesus didn't really walk on the water, but was merely stepping on stones. This would not be possible, for the boat was not near the shore. It was in the middle of the sea, so there would be no stones to step on. Moreover, when Peter got out and then doubted, he didn't fall right away into the sea. He began to gradually sink. Peter didn't fall off stones either. This is a miracle like other miracles Jesus performed. We can choose to believe or disbelieve them, but our choice will have consequences. For if Jesus didn't have power to walk on water, he also didn't have power to save us from sins, which means that we are still lost and without hope. This miracle is believable because of who did it, namely God himself. With that, our time is up for today. The Lord willing, we hope you'll join us for tomorrow's question and answer edition, seeking to answer the question, is it wrong for a married couple to decide not to have children? The Lord willing, on Monday, we will return to our study of Matthew, covering Matthew 14, verses 34 to 36, as we continue our walk through the Bible, one verse at a time. I'm not a Thank you for watching today's episode. We hope that you found it edifying and ask that you not only subscribe to our channel and podcast, but that you like and share this episode among your friends so that the saving gospel of Jesus Christ can go out to the whole world.